Good afternoon, colleagues, and thank you for joining us. My name is Shanti Singh Anthony, and I am the Knowledge Coordinator for PANCAP, based at the PANCAP Coordinating Unit in Georgetown. I will be your moderator for today's webinar. Let me begin by extending a warm welcome to you on behalf of the Director of PANCAP, Mr. Derek Springer, to this, our first webinar for the year. Before we begin, two logistic things to note. Firstly, our mics are muted. If you have questions as the presentation progresses, please type these in the question row on your panel button. We will address them during the question and answer segment at the end of the presentation. Secondly, the webinar will be recorded and shared on PANCAP's website for the benefit of the greater partnership. Today, we'll be discussing pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP and our presenter is Dr. Nikia Forbes. Dr. Forbes is the director of the National HIV AIDS and Infectious Disease Program at the Bahamas Ministry of Health. She is the consultant in infectious disease at the Princess Margaret Hospital and Doctors Hospital and an associate lecturer at the University of West Indies School of Clinical Medicine and Research in the Bahamas. Dr. Forbes graduated from medical school from the University of West Indies with honors in surgery and was the first recipient of the School of Medicine and Medical Research Cecil Bethel Award as a top graduate in her class in 2002. During her postgraduate specialty training in internal medicine, she was appointed a chief resident in medicine at the University Hospital of the University of the West Indies Kingston, Jamaica. After residency, Dr. Forbes completed a fellowship in infectious disease at the University of the West Indies Faculty of Medical Sciences, Kingston, Jamaica, in conjunction with the University of Carolina, South Carolina School of Medicine. She is actively engaged in medical research and presents her work at national, regional, international scientific meetings, including the Infectious Disease Society of America of which she is a member. We're privileged to have Dr. Forbes present to us this afternoon on pre-exposure prophylaxis with a focus of how this is being implemented in the Bahamas. Over to you, Dr. Forbes. Thank you, Shanti, for that kind welcome and Happy New Year to our colleagues in the Caribbean. I am going to share my screen now. Please allow me a moment to just minimize the toolbar. So it's really my pleasure to talk more on HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis with a wider context of PrEP, as it's also called, as an important prevention modality in our fight against AIDS. There it is. So this presentation will cover the HIV epidemic context and background, HIV prevention overview, and why HIV prevention should still be a very important focus in our work, what PrEP is and the science of PrEP, how to prescribe and monitor PrEP. And we have started implementing PrEP in the Bahamas, so I will share with you our preliminary experience with this new prevention, relatively new prevention modality. HIV and AIDS is still a significant problem. So we know that the UN reports on this annually and in 2016, there were 36.7 million people living with HIV globally. We are still seeing new infections. There were 1.8 million new infections reported globally and people are still dying of AIDS. There were 1 million AIDS-related deaths. Despite the fact that we have made major advances in treatment, we see that treatment coverage is still suboptimal, as only 19.5 million people were accessing antiretroviral treatment in 2016. Here in the Caribbean, we are particularly affected by HIV and AIDS. Let's review the regional data. In 2016, 310,000 adults and children we're living with HIV and AIDS in our Caribbean region. There were an estimated 18,000 new infections, 9,400 AIDS-related deaths, and treatment coverage was 52% among people living with HIV. 
In the Bahamas, we too have uh, significant challenges with HIV and AIDS. You will see that reported to the Ministry of Health at the end of 2016, we had 8,600 persons living with HIV and the HIV prevalence varies in certain groups. So the prevalence overall is about 2%, but the HIV prevalence in 15 to 49 year olds was 3.3%. And some populations are affected more than others. So the MSM prevalence as a result of a biobehavioral sentinel surveillance study in 2015 showed that the MSM prevalence at that time was 19.6%. There were 117 new HIV infections reported in 2016. So we have made major advances in HIV treatment and prevention. And so this graph or pictogram rather shows the number of new HIV infections in 2016 and how this has changed globally from since 2010. So we'll see that there were 1.8 million new infections as referenced. And this was actually a decrease from since 2010. So the number of new infections across the global population fell by 16%. Here in the Caribbean, we also saw a decline in new infections. And so new infections declined by 28% from since 2010. In the Bahamas, you will see that we have a line graph of the number of new infections reported by year in the country between 1985 and 2015. And we're seeing a slow but progressive decline in new infections to the lowest um, in quite some time in 2016, there were 117 new infections. Undoubtedly, all of this progress, including the decline in new infections, is as a result of all of the work that we are doing as fast-track countries and fast-track regions to end AIDS. And this includes prevention modalities, getting persons tested for HIV, treating all, and increasing viral suppression. And again, we know that HIV treatment is prevention. But while we focus on newer treatments and treating earlier and newer medications that we look forward to in the pipeline, we must remember that HIV prevention should be a focus and is still very important as HIV infection, acquiring HIV infection is preventable. So here you will see, this is actually a, a Twitter uh, post uh, that mentions that we have made significant progress in the response to HIV, but we must continue to emphasize the need to increase HIV prevention work. When we think about HIV prevention, there are many ways to think about it. Uh, we can think about uh, programmatic ways, uh, modalities, medications, but one way to think about it is a spectrum of interventions. So you will see here, I hope my mouse is showing. There is prior to HIV exposure, at the point of transmission, and after infection. And HIV prevention is complex. Behavioral change is complex. And so it's clever and strategic to think about HIV prevention as a spectrum of interventions to be used together to lower the risk of acquiring HIV infections. This is a very busy slide, but I'll just touch briefly on some of the ways that we can prevent HIV infection prior to exposure. And so some of these ways are addressing the social determinants of health, looking at behavioral change and behavioral change communication, screening for sexually transmitted infections. You will see that in the red box, PrEP is listed as a strategy for HIV prevention. And we look forward to new things in the pipeline in the, in the navy blue at the bottom of the lists. At the point of transmission, male and female condoms and lubricants are very good at preventing HIV and STIs from mother uh, to child transmission. There's treatments um, while, while the baby is in utero. There's post-exposure prophylaxis. And this is particularly important for sexual or non-occupational exposure. And then after infection, antiretroviral treatment or treatment as prevention. Why do we really need a spectrum of interventions? So I've borrowed the slide from Prof Figueroa. And so we look at prevention options and challenges and we'll see that there is no magic bullet to prevent HIV infection. There's no one single modality that is both 100% efficacious and effective. So what about abstinence? It's 100% efficacious 
but effectiveness is, is virtually nil. Condoms are effective, but the use must be consistent. Female condoms, we have reports that women do not like them, although, although this is a modality that is controlled by the woman. Uh, being faithful, that can prove di difficult at times, and voluntary HIV testing and counseling can be effective, uh, but persons may not be reached. It's hard to reach some populations that simply will not um, come into traditional testing sites. And behavioral change communication may be effective, but of itself is not enough. As a matter of fact, um, there's some information that um, shows us that in order to affect change uh, effectively, um, it often takes multiple sessions of um, counseling and um, reinforcing information. And so it may not be effective in, in itself. So that being said, the Bahamas has the full package of prevention services. However, we know that there are still challenges. So when we looked at our GARP report in 2015, we have some information on what is the HIV knowledge and condom use and multiple partners in our population. So as you can see in the first row, young men and women between the ages of 15 to 24 years of age that correctly identified ways of preventing HIV transmission sexually and could reject misconceptions about HIV, that was 4.4%. That was a number that, that did answer all of the questions correctly. In the second row, that uh, speaks to multiple partners. So we look at the percentage of women and men, 15 to 24 years of age, who had more than one partner in the past 12 months and used a condom. And that was 75.8%. So it, it was less than 100%. And we see that we have some information on behavior such as condomless anal intercourse in the MSM population and with a discordant or unknown male partner at 78.4% and 48.5%. So as you can see, there are risks uh, and um, a setup essentially for acquiring HIV infection. We will talk a little bit now on, on PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis to prevent HIV infection. So antiretroviral therapy can also be prevention. And so here we have a, a poster that says, can a pill a day prevent HIV infection? And indeed it can, let's talk more about that. So what is PrEP? It's a pill that is actually changing the conversation on HIV. Oral PrEP is an HIV prevention strategy in which a high risk HIV negative individual takes antiretroviral medication regularly to prevent HIV infection. This is traditionally Truvada, that is the brand name. It's a combination pill that contains tenofovir and emtricitabine, and it's been approved for HIV prevention, PrEP by the FDA from since July of 2012. It also has some added benefits. It provides protection against herpes simplex virus and hepatitis B infection too. It is a poly pill. It's a reverse transcriptase inhibitor. It's a single dose pill co-formulated with two medications also used in combination with other medications to treat HIV. It has an excellent safety record. It's potent well tolerated. It has a long half-life of about 48 hours intracellularly, and it penetrates highly into vaginal and rectal tissues. It's been around for quite some time, and so here is a timeline of the major PrEP trials, some of them, and those are in the green. So the green arrows speak to when some of these trials happened, and in the blue, uh, that actually corresponds with when certain approvals like CDC and FDA approvals became available. And so we're going to talk more about these in the coming slides. But in a nutshell, you'll see in November 2010, there was the IPREC study, and that was PrEP use in men who have sex with men and transgender women. And it was found that those who took PrEP were far less likely to be infected. So if you see the corresponding blue arrow, you'll see that the CDC made an interim guidance for PrEP in January 2011 for MSM populations. And then later on um, in 2012, we had other trials like the FEMPREP trial, but unfortunately that was stopped because they were unable to determine that it was effective, although adherence was low. And partners PrEP 
looked at oral PrEP and high risk heterosexual men and women. And that was quite effective. And you'll see that there was CDC interim guidelines in 2012 for PrEP in heterosexuals. And then we look at another trial, the Bangkok TDF study, which looked at PrEP in IV uh, drug users. And it was found that those who use PrEP were less likely to be infected. And so you'll see that there were guidelines put out for PrEP in IV drug use. And so the US Public Health Service made a clinical practice guideline for PrEP in May of 2014. So one of the key things to bear in mind about PrEP is that it works if persons are adherent to it. So in this table, we see a summary of, of some of the trials, some of which we've mentioned. So here on the left column, you'll see the trials IPREX, Partners PrEP, TDF2, and the Bangkok TDF study and the population. So you'll see that multiple populations were included and it was quite diverse. And the numbers were, were quite good as well. Um, almost 5,000 in partners PrEP. But look at this, these two columns. So you'll see there's a decrease in HIV incidence overall of 44% for persons taking PrEP. But the decrease is even more significant if persons are adherent. So for those persons that are proven to be adherent, the effectiveness was 92%. And similarly, in the other studies, you'll see that the effectiveness increases with adherence to the medication. There's good quality evidence that PrEP works when it's taken. So this is a meta-analysis of 18 studies reviewed, and there was data from 39 articles and six conference abstracts. You will see that there were about 20,000 participants across these studies. And there were serodiscordant couples, men who have sex with men, transgender women, women and heterosexual men and IV drug users. And across the populations and PrEP regimens, PrEP significantly reduced the risk of HIV acquisition compared with placebo. There was a 51% reduction. And trials with PrEP use, 70% demonstrated efficacy and effectiveness compared with placebo. And the relative risk was, was good at 0 0.3 and the p-value was very significant at less than 0.01. So in the trials where PrEP use was low or the adherence was poor, there was not a protective effect and the adverse events were similar between PrEP and placebo. So we know that PrEP is safe. It has very little side effects for most users, for 90% of users. And here are some of the side effects. About 10% of people will have some short-term mild side effects. For example, gastrointestinal symptoms like diarrhea, nausea, decreased appetite, abdominal cramping or flatulence. There can be a change in renal function. There can also be a change in liver or hepatic function. And there can be a slight decrease in bone mineral density in people taking PrEP containing the drug tenofovir. It is safe to use in pregnancy and breastfeeding. So whenever I'm asked to talk about PrEP, I always include this slide. <laughs> so this is a numbers needed to treat essentially so what that means is that when when randomized control trials are done we want to know how many people do you have to treat to get that effective intervention you have to treat a thousand people to get the effective intervention and so this is um iprex this is one of the prep trials that we mentioned in msm and transgender women and this is a landmark cardiovascular trial for patients who have had myocardial infarction or heart attack so we know a standard in those patients a gold standard and standard of care for patients who have had heart disease is a cholesterol lowering drug. That's what pravastatin is. And you can see that the risk goes down significantly, 31%, if patients who have heart disease take this lipid lowering drug. But you need to treat 250 people to see that kind of a benefit. However, getting back to PrEP, you will see that uh, the risk reduction is higher Persons are more likely to have the outcome, which would be HIV acquisition in this group. And the number needed to treat is a lot lower, just 62 uh, persons. And so this is very significant. So in, in doctor <laughs> technical language, PrEP really, really works. And the numbers needed to treat to get that outcome is really, really not all that high. So um, it, is, it is a good thing. In 2016, the World Health Organization came up with PrEP recommendations and suggested that people at substantial risk of HIV acquisition should be offered PrEP. It should be offered as an additional prevention choice 
in a comprehensive package of services as part of combination prevention. Offering PrEP should be a priority for populations with an HIV incidence of about three per hundred person years, or that is uh, high, high incidence populations. The CDC also has guidelines for PrEP use, and it's recommended for adult heterosexual men and women with substantial risk for HIV acquisition. For example, persons who've had a recent sexually transmitted infection or a high risk partner, although that doesn't include all the risks, sexually active MSM at substantial risk of HIV acquisition, serodiscordant couples, so that is a couple where one partner is HIV negative and the other partner is HIV positive, and an injection drug users. So that is some of the guidelines. Um, because PrEP has been around for, for a while and certainly uh, who is getting HIV every year? So we had a discussion at one of the meetings um, before we implemented these guidelines. It's certainly people who have a risk and are being exposed. And so we took the programmatic decision that we would offer PrEP for those persons at substantial risk of HIV infection from, from June of 2016. And so some of those examples were recent sexually transmitted infections, higher risk partners, multiple partners, and it's offered as a part of an additional prevention choice for persons at risk and as a part of combination prevention approaches. So specifically, we focus a lot on serodiscordant couples, M, uh, men who have sex with men, or those persons that engage in sex, sex for financial gain or otherwise. So these are some of the indications for the use of PrEP. The person should be proven or documented to be HIV negative and have a sex partner with HIV who is not virally suppressed or sexually active in a high HIV incidence prevalence population and any of the following, vaginal or anal sexual intercourse without condoms with more than one partner or a sexual partner with one or more HIV risk factors or a history of sexually transmitted infection by lab testing or self-report or syndromic STI treatment or use of post-exposure prophylaxis for sexual exposure. So PrEP is not good for everyone. Patients that are HIV positive should not be on PrEP. Persons with kidney disease, and that is if a serum creatinine or creatinine clearance is uh, abnormal, less than 60 mils per minute, signs and symptoms of acute HIV infection or probable recent exposure to HIV because you cannot know if the person is having acute HIV infection in, in those scenarios or they could be in the window period or an allergy or contraindication to any medication in the PrEP regimen. So this is an example of some of the antiretroviral medications for PrEP which we've spoken briefly about. I should mention to you that uh, tenofovir, emtricitabine or Trivada is not the only drug that can be used for PrEP. You can also use tenofovir lamivudine, and it's been shown that TDF, uh, tenofovir alone, is as good as tenofovir and tricitabine in combination. Now, what do you do before you start your client on PrEP? You should determine the eligibility. So keep in mind that it's going to require a commitment. You have to determine that there is substantial ongoing risk for HIV infection. The client ideally should be committed to taking HIV medications daily and committed to follow up. There's a need to screen for HIV and further assessment of early infection, for example, with HIV viral load, baseline hepatitis B screening and kidney function and sexually transmitted infection screening, pregnancy testing and counseling should be done. And the prescription is no more than 90 days at a time and adherence should be emphasized. This is a summary of some of the tests that should be offered when PrEP is first started. So you'll see the HIV test, the serum creatinine, hep B surface antigen, hepatitis C antibody, the RPR to, to, to screen for syphilis, uh, other syndromic screening uh, based on guidelines, et cetera, for chlamydia and gonorrhea, which is something we do in our clinic, a pregnancy test, review the vaccination history and consider risks for, for other infections and counseling. I can't understate how important counseling is to assess whether the client is at substantial risk. Again, it should be used as part of a, of a prevention uh, modality combination, so condoms and lubricants, and discuss the desire to, to continue PrEP and the willingness to take and follow up. 
Once PrEP is started, you're going to want to reassess and determine that there are no side effects, continue counseling, including risk reduction counseling, adherence, and other preventive measures such as condoms. Remember that it is not a standalone strategy and it doesn't provide STI pr protection. And so there will be a need to follow up for symptoms of STIs and testing for STIs and reevaluate the need for PrEP because certainly risk can change and it may not always stay the same as when the client was started on PrEP. Lab monitoring should be done at intervals on schedule. There are a lot of guidelines for how often tests should be done, but every three months, the client should be retested for HIV and STIs. The renal function should be reassessed at three months and then again at six months and annually. And pregnancy testing is something that needs to be done for women who are of childbearing potential. The side effects for PrEP should be reviewed. And so that would be renal function, uh, nausea and vomiting, et cetera, and review behavioral changes and risk reduction behaviors. So in the clinical trials, I can share with you that risk reduction, uh, risk behavior did not increase, but we know that uh, clinical trials are not the real world. So it's really recommended that PrEP is used um, as a combination prevention approach. So um, use of condoms has been emphasized in addition to PrEP, but patients don't always want to use condoms. Persons don't always want to use condoms. And so for those persons that choose not to use condoms, there is some information that the condoms could be um, stopped anywhere between seven to 21 days after starting the PrEP, but PrEP should continue as long as the risk of infection persists. Now, I want to just say that there, there is some overlap in these prevention modalities, correct? So if you, have, if you have prescribed PrEP for a person that is in a serodiscordant relationship, HIV uninfected persons may have a sex partner who is HIV infected. And so it's recommended that PrEP is continued until the HIV infected partner has achieved a stably suppressed viral load and then treatment can be prevention. However, there are certain HIV uninfected patients who should continue PrEP even if their partner, their, their seropositive partner has been on antiretroviral therapy. And those include those uh, persons who have multiple partners and are having condomless sex with other partners or have an ongoing concern that the HIV infected partner may not be taking or adhering to the antiretroviral regimen as prescribed. So, so that is some of the information available for the practical use of PrEP. Well, you know, there are reports that patients can acquire HIV while on PrEP. And so this would be called seroconversion after receiving PrEP. Now, there are several scenarios by which this can happen. The person on PrEP may be documented to have um, a new HIV infection, and that could be because HIV infection was pre-existing before starting PrEP. Or you could acquire an HIV infection due to no or inconsistent use of PrEP, and there are other scenarios. And so there is a concern for drug resistance and PrEP. So it's documented in the literature that persons can become infected with a drug-resistant strain of HIV while on PrEP. And there were, as a matter of fact, two cases reported, despite the fact that the tenofovir levels were consistent with adherence. Hence, again, the need to, to reinforce that other prevention modalities like condoms can be helpful to avoid this. And additionally, acquired drug resistance can develop while on PrEP. For example, in the Partners PrEP study and Fem PrEP, they did find that two and four women respectively were believed um, to contract HIV and develop drug resistance. Because PrEP, remember, is only um, one or two drugs. And so that is um, not really the way we treat HIV. It's usually um, combination antiretroviral therapy. And so it can select for, for drug resistance based on the HIV virology and, and how HIV replicates. What do you do if someone uh, becomes HIV seropositive while on PrEP? Antiretroviral therapy, combination antiretroviral therapy should be offered as soon as possible. So after the first presumably rapid test becomes positive, if the confirmatory test will be delayed, you can transition to a fully suppressive uh, combination antiretroviral therapy. And the aim is to avoid the risk of resurgence in viral load and secondary transmissions. 
there are other ways we're going to be providing this in the future. So in the pipeline, they have prep on demand. It maybe could be used before high risk and there will be other long acting drugs, but, but we're not there. That's not into clinical practice yet. So we do offer prep as part of our prevention package. It is available at our clinic in Royal Victoria Gardens, and, and we've recently expanded and are trying to increase the rollout of this. It is tenofovirin tricitabine in one tablet daily. It's free of cost to the client. We are seeing an increased number of persons start PrEP. Um, more persons are inquiring about it. And really, we have serodiscordant couples and MSM um, taking PrEP right now, but it is really quite early. Uh, we are finding that adherence and willingness and commitment to continue the PrEP daily and long-term is, is one of the challenges. And patients have uh, qualitatively given information that they prefer to, to use condoms at this point. But we are currently rolling it out and, and we're seeing an increase in uptake. And so hopefully we'll have more to share in the future. But PrEP has been well used in, in many countries and you can see that it's been around for a while. I guess it will be six this year. And it is a tool that really, really can work and help to reduce the number of new infections. So the WHO came um, out with a publication in 2017, I think in the, in the fall or winter of 2017, looking at HIV prevention in the Latin America and Caribbean region. And they recommend a complete set of prevention interventions, including PrEP, so HIV testing and counseling, STI diagnosis and treatment, PrEP and PEP, uh, condoms and lubricants, treatment, um, treating all, uh, community outreach and civil society partnerships and private partnerships, and of course, sex information, education, and behavioral change. So the Bahamas did have the complete set of prevention interventions, and there are many other countries in the Caribbean planning to rule this out later on. For example, Brazil and Barbados is going to be offering um, PrEP as well. So there is a potential role for our Caribbean countries to reduce new HIV infections. It can be effective for hard to reach populations and we know that it works and it's safe there will be challenges however like knowledge awareness accessibility willingness to take commitment to continue um, cost implications certainly because um, as a region you see our our treatment coverage is 52 percent and, and we we are aiming for 90 90 90 and again adherence but i have no doubt that this will be improved with support and partnerships that will facilitate the successful introduction and scale up of PrEP in our region. For example, uh, PEPFAR so, so kindly allowed some of our countries, um, myself, Dr. Best from, from Barbados, our colleagues from Guyana, to tour some of the successful PrEP programs in Latin America in 2017. And it was very informative to see PrEP being rolled out in very innovative ways. Certainly PAHO WHO and their support in offering workshops and technical assistance and certainly PANCAP in helping us to have a forum to share ideas and support for how we're going to introduce these new modalities and other interventions in our fight against AIDS. And so I'll summarize by saying that we must remember that HIV prevention is a combination prevention approach. There is no standalone HIV prevention modality that is 100% effective and efficacious, but PrEP is one part of the HIV prevention puzzle. It's effective if used as recommended and adherence is paramount. It's an additional HIV prevention option for the Bahamas. However, challenges exist, but we're working through them. Partnerships will help to facilitate successful impl implementation, and there's a need to continue to prioritize HIV prevention work as part of our efforts to end AIDS. I thank you for your attention, and I'll take any questions and open the floor and hand the mic back over to Shanti for any discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ferb. Thank you for an excellent presentation, really very comprehensive. Um, so, again, to the participants, if there are any questions, please go ahead and type those in. Um, in the meanwhile, I have a few questions, uh, Dr. Forbes. Um, so, again, congratulations. I think the presentation was really well put together and very comprehensive. Uh, my first question to you is on your, um, your knowledge among the 15 to 24 year years old 
um, in the Bahamas, comprehensive knowledge. And I noted that that's 4.4. .4. Um, I am thinking here that maybe that sounds a little bit on the lower side. Um, and in fact, I was wondering what's the original source of that information because I noted that in your slide, you said it was GARPA 2015. Um, so I was just a little bit curious about that. Um, one comment I really like the way you've, you've sort of, sort of juxtaposed prep to myocardial infarctions. And for me, what really stood out is the dollar value of doing prep. So it's preventing new infections, but how how valuable this is in terms of, of putting a dollar to, a dollar sign to it. So I think that's really, I really like the way that was presented. Um, I had a question in terms of identifying persons at high risk. I like the slide where you had um, sort of parameters that you would look for when you identify somebody at high risk for HIV and therefore should be considered for PrEP. Um, and I wonder if you can share with us based on your experience, um, if you're to prioritize uh, the list that you have in, in your context, and maybe if, if you can extrapolate a little bit to the Caribbean's context, what will be, um, what are those three or four ones that you'll probably put on top in terms of identifying persons for, for pre-exposure prophylaxis? So I'll stop at this point maybe. Okay, thank you very much. Those are all excellent questions. So to address the first one, uh, the HIV knowledge in the GARPA. So that is essentially a list of five um, prepared questions. And there, there's usually a survey tool. So as a matter of fact, that survey was done some time ago. I think it was in 2015. And it was actually in the teenage age group. And so we found that uh, they were able to answer some questions like condom use, but they couldn't answer all five of the questions correctly. So uh, that is some of the information that we had, but it may not be generalizable to the population outside of that age group. And again, uh, the challenge was if you don't get all five questions right, it's you're not considered to have um, knowledge um, based on that survey, even though four of the five questions could be answered correctly. But that is a question I get every time um, I answer that. But I but I agree 100%. There there is an opportunity to increase. Um, sexual knowledge and um, we do have programs in in schools and so that is an opportunity to strengthen knowledge and and work on that prevention modality what you said about MI and uh, myocardial infarction and um, cholesterol lowering medications and prep and and the uh, comparison of the two I, I always like to put that in there because <laughs> it's well known in the medical community that you're not going to treat anyone with an MI without aspirin, lipid lowering medications, blood pressure medications, etc. But um, for those persons that don't work in our field, it, it really helps to drive home how uh, important it is. Um, the risk of developing the outcome is far higher in um, persons at risk for, for HIV than, than people um, with some pre-existing heart disease to have a myocardial infarction and the number needed to treat is much lower and then you hit the nail on the head when we look at the cost of prep because we're hearing oh you know these medications cost we need to um prioritize and we need to treat persons that are hiv positive but if we think about it and i saw the other day that um i can't remember who it was that, that put that out but we looked at the um health expenditure for HIV and AIDS um, per capita and for AIDS um, for HIV patients um, in our region. And we're spending a lot of money or it's very expensive to, to um, care for someone once they become HIV positive to the tune of thousands of dollars um, and preventing opportunistic infections. And certainly those with advanced disease, it's even more expensive to treat. But when we look at the cost of Travada, it's $9 for a month supply and it can prevent HIV infection. So I have no doubt that um, strategically paying for prevention in this case pays off <laughs> no pun intended versus a new hiv infection and all the things that can happen after that lastly you asked a really good question about high risk persons now i i did cut out a couple slides in an effort to make the presentation um timely but um i should say that when considering prep you must consider your epidemic context and certain things about the situation in your country and who you're going to 
focus and strategize on. So I can speak for um, the Bahamas. I I'll try to prioritize. Um, I would say Sarah Discord in couples. Because if you really think about it <laughs> and get down to the basics, almost everybody in our in our current context, I would say that HIV is sexually transmitted in the Caribbean. That we don't really have a problem with IV drug use in the Bahamas. But mostly, new infections come about as a result of sexual transmission, barring mother-to-child transmission. So I, I would have to say serodiscordant couples based just on that information. And certainly, if you consider HIV uh, prevalence in certain populations, then you, you will have to prioritize it on those populations that you know have an increased um, HIV prevalence rate based on, on the information you have in your country. So MSM, the BBSS um, demonstrator showed to us that it was 19.6%, so I would have to say MSM. Now, we do have some information on CSW, some uh, commercial sex work, limited information. None of the sex workers that we've tested have actually been diagnosed HIV positive. Now, what does that mean? We don't know because, you know, again, sampling bias, those ones that come to us, maybe their health seeking behavior is different. But um, I would say it would have to be at risk persons. So, so I, I'll go with um, a serotis Gordon couples and MSM and, and transgender women at this point for our country. But each country will be different and you have to consider your epidemic when, when making your PrEP guidelines. Okay, all right, great. Thank you, Dr. Forbes. I have three questions from the participants. So Dr. Rambaran is saying thank you, and she's asking how long, how long on average do you find patients staying on PrEP in the current rollout program? Um, and then she wants, she's seeking a clarification. She's saying that um, you said Truvada is $9 for a monthly supply. Curious because it's about $50 for a month supply in Barbados by a private pharmacy. Um, yes. Um, I have another question from another participant who is asking if you can provide details on what is being done to encourage adherence amongst the persons on PrEP now. Um, and then the final question from the part from another participant is, is saying um, should should there be stronger messages on additional prevention um, since prep will not protect you from some of the other STIs yeah excellent questions again so um, prep is relatively new here it's how long are persons staying on it it's variable um, there are persons that stay on for a few months and there are persons that are, that are still on it after starting from last year. So it really, it really depends on, on the client and their situation. Um, some of the things that have, um, been reported back to us is, no, it's all right. They, they'll use condoms. Um, they prefer not at this point. Um, the cost, I, I'm not sure I heard you correctly. Is it, did you say $50 shanty in a private pharmacy? In the yeah. Um, Curious because it's about fifty U.S. dollars for a month's supply in Barbados by a, a private by a private pharmacies. Okay, hmm, interesting. Well, um, we have a different situation than Barbados. Um, we, for the most part, antiretroviral therapy is free of cost um, to the client, and we we don't have that um, same. Um, for for that drug, I'm not sure if um, where the private pharmacy in Barbados is procuring the drug from or what their markup is, but um, um, we don't have that same experience with with Tenofovir. I'm interested in. I'm not too sure why 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 so expensive. I don't know if Dr. Best is here with us. I can't see the attendees on my. Um, um, Dr. Best is not here, but I'm wondering too. Um, Dr. Forbes, whether the nine dollars per month supply in in the Bahamas, whether it's generic or branded. Oh, because it's generic. I, right, because generic is about nine dollars per month, and and maybe the fifty US in in Barbados, it's probably branded. Okay, that's that's fully possible. Um, yeah. And then there was a question as to uh, what about adherence? Yes, this has to be reinforced before persons start PrEP and at the follow-up visit. And certainly they should be offered 
material and support for why adherence is, is important for, for a lot of reasons, um, including acquisition of HIV infection. I, I believe last year, was it at Roy? There was a report, I, I can't remember which country that was, of, of a client that had been on PrEP that had significant risk for HIV acquisition and multiple partners that, that did in fact contract HIV while, while being adherent to PrEP. So adherence is, is very, is very, very important, um, as well as prevention. And the last question was on, what was it, messages? Should there be messages? Right, whether we should have um, stronger messages placed on other prevention modalities since PrEP will not pr pr protect you from some of the other STIs. Um, and then as a follow-up to that question from the same participant is asking, um, if you need to discontinue PrEP, for how long do you need to continue taking PrEP before you, you think about discontinuing? Right, okay, so yes, there. Um, I can't under, understate the importance of providing HIV prevention in, in a combination approach. And messaging is very important and reinforcing. Um, if you need to discontinue PrEP, it should be about 21 days after the last exposure. Let me just go back to my slide on that. I had one. Twenty-eight days after the last possible HIV exposure. Okay. Okay, so that's noted. Thank you. Um, I had a follow-up question to one of the questions from the participant that spoke to um, how do you encourage adherence amongst amongst persons on prep? And I noted that one of the challenges that you have, based on your experience, is that. Um, there's been relatively low adherence, um, and so I'm wondering if if you can if you can really um, pinpoint for us if there is something um, there that can tell us. You know, I, I assume that when you start persons on prep, you would have done the counseling and you've emphasized how important counseling is, but there would have been that initial willingness and anxiety um, to start prep. Um, and so what happened after? Why is it that then after some time that then moves to low adherence? All right, so um, in some scenarios, yeah, so as you, as you um, did say that sometimes there is some anxiety around starting PrEP. So uh, with prescribing HIV medications and, and treatment per se, I, I really have to emphasize the importance of communication and counseling. And so it can allay some of the anxiety once um, persons have the full information and counseling is done effectively. Um, so why, why have some persons become non-adherent after starting PrEP? So some examples, um, their risk, their risk um, exposure may have changed. They may have been in a serodiscordant relationship and the partners, the HIV positive partners now uh, achieving viral suppression. Um, some persons are saying they would rather just not take one um, a pill every single day because they're well. They they don't have HIV infection. There's a, why take a medication if, if there's if there's if they're not treating anything and they would rather use condoms instead. And so those are some of the feedback that that we've received. Um, I I would say that one would have to continue uh, adherence counseling for those persons that that have a significant risk. Um, for example, uh, continued exposure. But I'll tell you, um, it takes multiple counseling sessions to to have impact, right? So you'll have to continue to provide adherence counseling and and good support. Yeah, I think I think we can emphasize and and overemphasize and keep emphasizing the importance of counseling. But um, there are no more questions, Dr. Forbes, and thank you again so much for an excellent presentation and a really um, interactive, interactive session with us this afternoon. So um, this really does bring us to the end of today's webinar. 
uh, just outline to you a few immediate next steps. You will receive the presentation via email. You will also receive a very short survey seeking your feedback on the webinar. Your feedback is really very important to us. It will allow us to better understand and therefore address the knowledge needs of our audiences in the, in the region. I encourage you, therefore, to please take a few minutes and provide us with that feedback. Um, on behalf of the director of PlanCap, Mr. Derek Spring, and all of the participants today, let me thank you again, Dr. Forbes, for investing in the webinar and for sharing your experience on pre-exposure prophylaxis in the Bahamas. To all of the participants, thank you so much for joining us today, and I do hope that the session has been useful to each one of you. As a reminder, the webinar was recorded and will be posted on PlanCap's website for the benefit of the wider partnership. Please do join us for our next webinar in February. The announcement will be sent out shortly. Continue to stay engaged with PANCAP and with the HIV response in the region. Email us, visit our, visit our website at www.pancap.org for more information on HIV in the region and follow us on our social media platforms on Facebook and Twitter. Um, thanks again, everyone, for joining us this afternoon and do have a great day. See you at our next webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye.